right, see if we Good were. evening, everyone. Thank you Absolutely. so much for coming out tonight uh, to our Candidates Forum for Santa Barbara County Sheriff. Uh, first, I'd like to thank the candidates for all making it out tonight, uh, Lieutenant Brian Olmstead, Lieutenant Eddie Shway, and Sheriff Phil Brown. And thank you, too, for your public service um, and putting yourself out here to really um, speak to the voters about issues that matter for us here in Isla Vista and around the county. We really appreciate your time and your service. Um, as many of you know, here in Santa Barbara County, the sheriff's a very important role. Specifically here in Isla Vista, uh, the sheriff's office is our primary law enforcement provider. Uh, when you call 911, it's very likely that, that, it'll, that it will be a deputy sheriff uh, showing up to your emergency. Um, the sheriff's office is the primary interface for law enforcement here in Isla Vista, and in many ways, one of the main interfaces that we have with the county of Santa Barbara. In addition to their service here in Isla Vista, the Santa Barbara Sheriff's Office oversees the custody of inmates in our county jail, uh, provides protection for the courthouse, and provides many other crucial law enforcement and public safety services. Um, tonight, this is really an opportunity for you, the voters and residents of Isla Vista, to hear from these uh, distinguished candidates about uh, their positions and their vision for this office. Uh, the Isla Vista Community Services District does not take any position on these candidates. Um, as we are a government agency, this is solely informational and educational. So we thank you all for coming out tonight, we thank the candidates, and we hope that you enjoy your time here at tonight's forum. Thank you so much, and I'll now allow the moderators to introduce themselves. Hi everyone, it's great to see you all. My name is Ali Adam, and I am the Community <coughs> Services District Coordinator within the office of the EVPLA, which is the external vice president for local affairs. And currently, that is Yaika, so I'll, you can say something after me now. Hi. <laughs> um, or yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Okay, <laughs> yeah, go okay. ahead. Hi, I'm Yaika, I'm the external vice president of local affairs for the 2018 and 2019 term. Awesome. Uh, so my name is Adam Chauhan, I'm the liaison for the Police and Community Affairs Forum, also in the mm -hmm. office of the EVPLA through Associated Students. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about how this is going to go down and how we're going to run the actual forum. Uh, so first we'll have each of the candidates introduce themselves, um, about two minutes for each of your introductions. We'll try to time it and just kind of let you know if you're, if you're going a little bit longer. Um, after that, um, we'll go to our two topics. So we have two <coughs> topics that we're going to cover today. Uh, the first topic is sexual assault uh, and the second topic is going to be police and resident relations. Um, each of those questions as well, we'll hope for about two minutes for each of the answers, and then we'll start with a new candidate every time we ask one of those questions. We'll take turns asking the questions as well and posing them to you guys. Um, is that awesome? Make sense? Okay, perfect. Uh, so we'll start with introductions. If you wanted to say. Okay. Yeah, you can start. Okay, okay. thanks. Uh, hi, I'm Lieutenant Brian Olmstead. I've worked for the Sheriff's Office for 28 years under three different sheriffs, working my way up to a management position. I've worked or managed virtually every division in our department, including narcotics, gangs, human trafficking, homicide, civil bureau, and both the North and South County patrol divisions. I've ran the training bureau, and for 16 years I've taught at the local police academy. I've especially been proud of the six years I was assigned to the Isla Vista Foot Patrol, both as a sergeant and then later as the station commander. During that time, I fostered extra, excellent relationships with the university and city college students, the Isla Vista residents, and the university administration. <coughs> Along the way, I earned a master's degree in business administration and graduated from the FBI National Academy and Sherman Block Leadership Institute. I've received the Narcotic Officer of the Year for the state of California and I've also received numerous uh, department awards. I've volunteered for the Special Olympics, PTA in the past, and also for the last eight years I've been a scoutmaster with a local Boy Scout troop. I've served as the Emergency Management Liaison and Mutual Aid Coordinator for the department and I'm proud of the department's working relationship with first responders and the public. But that work needs to be improved at the highest level. We need a new leader who will learn, take responsibility, and cooperate with partner agencies and community organizations. As the sheriff, I'll focus on issues here at home, preventing crime, improving response time, disaster preparedness, community outreach, and meeting the needs of the mentally ill and people in crisis. Thank you. Yeah, you can <coughs> I'm uh, Lieutenant Eddie Shway, and I've been a local law enforcement officer in the community for over 32 years. I've served for the Santa Barbara Sheriff's Office for 31 years. I worked for a short time in, the, in a small community, the city of Guadalupe, as a police officer. Uh, I also taught at the uh, Regional Academy since 1999 to about two, 2015, and I also taught advanced officer training for the Governor's Office for about the same time. 
Uh, I've worked from the Ventura County line to the San Luis County line during my career, and I've worked with numerous agencies from San Luis to Ventura County on various projects. Uh, I taught arrest control and use of force in the academies. I uh, created the, uh, the uh, Behavioral Sciences Unit in 2015 and brought uh, the Crisis Intervention Team to our agency and uh, started to train officers throughout the county and included UCPD and Santa Maria Police Department, Lompoc PD, uh, we offered it to Guadalupe and all the agencies in the county. We partnered with Santa Barbara Police Department and we trained about 700 officers or so in a short two-year period. And we also put, had a, a certified 40-hour course, which we put on in uh, November, and we have another one in August. And our plan is to, to do this every, uh, every year, at least twice a year. It's important to serve our community and address the needs of the community and to give the community a voice. Uh, I, I want to do that as sheriff. I want to give the community a voice and have our diverse community represent it to provide training and tools to officers to better serve the community. And those tools involve tools of teaching officers how to better use force or less force and de-escalate a situation through crisis intervention training and teaching officers to de-escalate uh, situations that are already uh, out of hand. And uh, uh, providing these officers tools will assist the community um, and, uh, and, and better serve communities from the south to the north. All right, go ahead. Well, thank you. Good evening, everyone. I'm your sheriff, Bill Brown. And I want to start by thanking Allie and Adam and Ethan and all of the people here from the Isla Vista Community Services District for setting up this forum tonight so that we can communicate with each other and talk about the sheriff's race. Um, I also want to thank those who helped to do the organization of this event. These things don't just happen by themselves and there are a lot of moving parts and I appreciate it very much. Um, I have a, a, a diverse law enforcement career. I started my career up in the city of Pacifica, up in the Bay Area. I worked there for not quite three years and then transferred down to the Inglewood Police Department down in Los Angeles where I did the bulk of my career uh, in terms of actual years. It was 12 and a half years with Inglewood PD. Uh, I went through the ranks and ended up becoming a police chief in the city of Moscow, Idaho. Left the state of California for three years, went to Idaho. In addition to policing the city of Moscow, uh, we were responsible for policing the University of Idaho as well. So I had experience being a police chief in a university community and actually providing police service to the University of Idaho and its students and faculty. Um, from from uh, Idaho, I came back to California in 1995 and became the Chief of Police of the City of Lompoc here in Santa Barbara County. I worked as the Chief there for 11 years before I ran for Sheriff and was elected and since then and for about an 11 and a half year period uh, I have been your Sheriff and have provided a, a steady, proven, uh, compassionate and energetic type of leadership uh, to the Sheriff's Office. And I am a strategic reformer who has developed uh, a number of different programs and delivered on campaign promises that I made despite unprecedented and overwhelming fiscal challenges that we've had to deal with. Uh, despite those, today's service delivery by the men and women of the Sheriff's Office remains exemplary. And Isla Vista has benefited from the Sheriff's Office and from my leadership uh, in collaboration with uh, many other uh, agencies and community partners. We have developed uh, a greatly enhanced community policing concept for Isla Vista and have worked very closely. In fact, I've worked closely with people in this room to uh, work on safety issues and to develop ways of better policing this unique community. I've been a champion of the mentally ill, working at the state level and the local level to work to divert as many people as possible from the criminal justice system. I have a very long track record of community involvement. Um, I don't just show up at election time or cite something that I did years ago. I am actively involved in many causes that help victims, including the youth, the vulnerable, the sick, the addicted, and those who have served our country. Uh, on June 5th, I ask for your vote to continue leading the Sheriff's Office, your Sheriff's Office, in the right direction. Thank you. Thank you.
Great, so thank you all. We're going to now move into our first topic of questions, which is sexual assault. This topic was decided on by students at UCSB. So it's gonna be posed to all of you, but I'll have you, Lieutenant Olmstead, answer it first. It's, what do you think law <coughs> enforcement can do better in terms of addressing cases of sexual assault? And if you could keep your answers to about two minutes, that'd be great. Um, I think uh, we, we need to, uh, Initially, uh, it'd be nice to put out more education on safety. Um, I think, uh, and also educate people on how to report sexual assaults, um, and uh, where it's easier for them to, uh, easier for people to report it, or if they witness something, to report it to law enforcement. I think getting law enforcement out, walking, and uh, improving relations with uh, the residents of IMD is important. But I also think it's law enforcement working with the district attorney's office. And over the last couple of years, as the manager of our human trafficking unit, I've worked uh, extensively with uh, the district attorney's victim witness unit and offering services to human trafficking victims. And I think sexual assaults um, uh, victims are similar. And we need to have that intensive uh, offering of services to uh, help uh, victims of sexual assault. Thank you. Thank you. So go ahead. Do you want me to repeat the question? Um, sure. All right. Uh, what do you think law enforcement can do better in terms of addressing cases of sexual assault? So when I, when I read this question, I uh, actually really, really gave some thought to it because uh, our deputies are usually very compassionate and do a really good job at investigations. And um, so... Uh, I talk to a lot of people, and uh, so what what I found is we do have a detective assigned to Isla Vista now, and that has in, that has improved situations with sexual assault reports. Um, the UCPD is perceived at doing a, a better job at sexual assaults than the sheriff's office, and so I, I was looking into this, and and here are some things that I that I found. First, on, on one hand, with prosecution. Uh, a lot of a lot of that is up to the district attorney. So, if we don't have the evidence, uh, the, you know, it's it's really out of a, a sheriff's control if the district attorney doesn't file on those cases. Um, in uh, with with UCPD, uh, people have told me that it was more consistent with the, their investigations. They had they have uh, more of a community oriented policing philosophy. You know, they have one detective that works closely with care and those are the advocacy group that's there. And CARE, we, we use Rape Crisis, which Rape Crisis, is, it's in our policy to call them when we have a sexual assault case. And they, they are now called, uh, uh, they changed their name, and uh, STESA. So Standing Together to End Sexual Assaults. And so they do slightly different jobs. So our deputies call STESA, and UCPD calls CARE you know, the Campus Advocacy uh, Resources and Education Unit. So CARE actually does more outreach than STESA. So our detective that's assigned here, uh, he, our detective basically has made a practice of calling both of those <coughs> adv advocacy groups to give uh, survivors more of an option. So some of the things we can do is, is make that more, um, more standard with our cases to give survivors more of an option. Uh, green dot training, I don't know if anybody's familiar with green dot training, but we, we put four deputies and a sergeant through green dot training. The, the UC has been doing this. And this is, this is the training where if you see something, say something. If you hear something, tell somebody, right? And so the, the, the three Ds they teach is direct, delegate, responsibility, or distraction. And it basically teaches students and faculty and and members of the community, if, if you you know how to recognize something, if somebody is maybe they've had too much to drink and they're getting into a dangerous situation, to do something, to take action, to have an intervention. So the UC does a very good job at uh, at advocating for this type of training to reduce power-based violence, and I think the sheriff's office needs to do the same thing. So we need to kind of follow some of the along the same lines that they do. Uh, they do a lot more town hall events, event talks. They have 
informal open meetings with the community. Uh, the lieutenant there has open office hours where people can come in and informally talk about some of these issues. And care also, you know, not everybody wants to prosecute in these cases. So we need to build public trust so they, that people can report uh, in a, an anonymous way so, so we can like document these cases and we need to support that. Also, um, uh, working on increasing survivor com comfort, promoting law enforcement as an ally, which involves public trust, uh, allowing people to report for documentation only and decrease barriers when we can. Uh, building choices, more choices for survivors in these investigations. And uh, so, it, in an op you know, for instance, like options with SART, you know, a sexual response team, you know, give options of survivors to, to respond with law enforcement or without law enforcement if they don't feel comfortable in doing that. And, uh, and we need to work on presenting uh, as, with advocacy as a team, meaning care and uh, uh, rate, formerly rape crisis. So training is very important. Training, I, I would like to see us do more of the green dot training so at least officers on our department know what that is and, and how that we can uh, support survivors. Implicit bias uh, training, trauma care, which involves crisis intervention training, so more crisis intervention training, which also involves compassionate communication and building community trust. So uh, also jurisdiction is what I heard. I've heard that some community members say, well, you know, they hear that, uh, you know, uh, they call a deputy and the deputy says, well, this happened in Santa Barbara or this happened on the campus. So they feel like they've been kind of pushed off. So I think that we need to work on putting into our policies and procedures a warm handoff to where we stay, we stay with a survivor until we're not needed if it is a jurisdictional area. So uh, these are some of the things that, that, I've, that I've seen. The green dot training is, is very important. Um, just uh, Tuesday, we had a uh, young student who uh, completed suicide on, on, uh, on the bridge. And uh, that's, that's where communities need to learn that if you, if you think something's going on, you need to say something. Uh, if you hear something, you need to tell somebody uh, to uh, take care of each other. So, so those are some of the things that, that, I, that I came up with. So I'll, I'll start like just around two or three minutes. I'll start just like putting it in. Thank you. Well, first of all, I, I want to just mention some, some good news in, on this topic, and that is that crime in general, and specifically sexual assaults and rapes and attempted rapes, are down in Isla Vista substantially from where they were before. Just to give you an idea, in 2013 in Isla Vista, there were 14 forcible rapes reported. Uh, in 2014, there were 26. In 2015, there were 14. In 2016, there were 18. In 2017, the Sheriff's Office assigned a detective to Isla Vista Foot Patrol with a specialized background in sexual assault investigation. And that year, coincidentally, was also when we started to see a lot of the uh, collaborative programs that came out of the Ivy Safe initiative and uh, other partnerships that we have with other organizations in the community uh, start to come to fruition. They've already been mentioned, uh, the CARES program, the Green Dot program, and uh, others that uh, really got the message out that uh, sex without consent is not sex, it's rape. And everyone has a responsibility to make sure that that doesn't happen in a community, uh, to look out for each other, and to recognize that if there's not an affirmative consent that's given, uh, that's, that is a rape. That's not an act of sex. Uh, since that time, in 2017, there were a total of seven forcible rapes, and so far this year, there's been one reported forcible rape. So the numbers are going down, and that is a very positive thing. The bad news is even one sexual assault or rape is too many, and we need to do whatever we can to try to prevent that from occurring. And that prevention element that's been discussed and uh, that I mentioned is, is very, very important for everyone to recognize that we all have a responsibility to be involved in this and to take action and to step in if something is happening that is untoward. It is uh, evidence, I think, of the fact that the community policing 
that we are doing in Isla Vista is working and is effective. We have Isla Vista Foot Patrol deputies, UCSB officers assigned to Foot Patrol who are caring, who do uh, take this very seriously, who do provide very compassionate service. And I think that it's evident that the combination that we have found with uh, working with our partners, with working with the university, with making sure that these resources are available are having a very distinct impact on the number of sexual assaults, which is very positive news in Isla Vista. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> so our next question in the same topic um, is how will you direct your officers to respond to a report of a sexual assault? And um, we'll start in the middle with Lieutenant Chway. And then in the same order. Yeah. Well, for, first, first of all, we need to provide our officers the tools and the training uh, to, to do this. And uh, when, when we can have consistent personnel who have the training, like uh, Hulu Gutierrez, who's our detective, who has the, the, the training and experience and, and special training in this, um, that works out very well because he does work with the advocacy groups as, uh, as a team. Um, we do have other officers who do have some of the training, but not all of them have it. So we need to make sure that we have everybody properly trained, um, and we need to to give uh, we need to give survivors options. And some of these some of these statistics where we have cut down on um, sexual assaults in, in Isla Vista, you know, these are the reported assaults. So not every every assault goes. Um, not every assault is reported, so you know we need to encourage people to uh, to have the trust of the, of the sheriff's office uh, to report these crimes, and and that involves giving survivors um, options. You know, maybe maybe they don't want to uh, uh, have the report uh, made known and and uh, uh, prosecute in some of these cases. Um, maybe uh, maybe they're they're afraid of how uh, how we handle the SART the SART exams. So you know we need to work with the advocacy groups to 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 come up with ways of giving them uh, compassionate uh, options for the investigations. And in, in these investigations, you need to take time. So you know they can't be rushed. Uh, you need to take the time. You need to, to build relationships with with the uh, uh, survivors. To uh, properly investigate these, so um, I, I would I would like our officers and deputies to respond consistently uh, with compassion and uh, and with advocacy groups as, as a team. Um, what I want to see in in our investigation of sexual assaults and our interaction with people who have uh, had these crimes committed against them is to treat that person as though that person was a member of our family. To treat them with the respect, the dignity, and the compassion that they deserve after facing one of the most traumatic experiences they're likely to experience in their life. And it's very, very important that we do our job, which is in some ways very clinical and very um, fact-based and, and not especially uh, compassionate in a way that is compassionate in a way that, that doesn't make a person feel as though they have been victimized again. And I think we do a good job of that. I think that the sheriff's deputies and the UCSB officers assigned to foot patrol are uh, among the best in terms of doing this anywhere. Um, I also think it's very important for us to make sure that we do everything we can do to solve those crimes, to give a, a thorough investigation to all of the cases, um, and to make sure that we don't uh, have a, a backlog or have um, evidence uh, in terms of a rape kit that sits in an evidence locker or in a refrigerator somewhere and doesn't get analyzed. Um, there's been a lot of discussion and news about rape kits in certain communities that are still way behind in terms of being processed and potentially sexual assault uh, suspects could be arrested if they were all processed. I'm happy to be able to tell you that we don't have a single rape kit that has not been processed in the Santa Barbara County Sheriff's Office. They are routinely processed right away and they enter the state's uh, database and if a suspect who is unknown that has committed a sexual assault commits one and uh, his DNA is taken, uh, 
it can be entered into the sexual assault database, into the DNA database, and uh, can we can come up with a hit on that. So I think that's extremely important as well. And then lastly, I think it's very, very important to, to maintain the excellent working relationships that we have with the other community resources that are committed and dedicated to sexual assault. You've heard of CARES, you've heard of uh, the training, the Green Dot training and, and, and student orientation training that occurs at UCSB, which is essential and very important. Um, cultures can be changed for the better. And I think it's evident that uh, this campaign that took place um, uh, to inform people that, that, they, that all of us have a responsibility and that uh, men in particular uh, cannot assume that if someone is, uh, you know, that it's okay somehow for them to take advantage of someone who is not capable of giving their consent. Um, I think it's also fortunate that we live in a community that has other resources outside the immediate area that are great resources as well. And I'm talking particularly about the rape crisis uh, centers that we have in both the North and the South counties. Uh, they're also staffed with people who are very dedicated, very caring, and work very, very closely with us to be there. And while we're conducting an investigation, they can be there to be an advocate for the survivor who goes through that terrible experience. We, we do a good job at that. We need to continue to make sure that we uh, are doing that job in every case that we investigate. I agree with both my oppo opponents, um, but I, I think we still need to look at how do we try to prevent them in the first place. I, I think uh, um, I live as the foot patrol, both the sheriff's office and the university police officers assigned to it have to continue to do outreach to the community, make sure they're walking around on foot, not in the vehicles, and just having a presence out there, getting to know the residents of IV. Um, and they also, we need to improve our education, just like uh, both my opponents said. But then, once we do get called to one of these incidents, we really need to concentrate on doing a good investigation right from the start. It, it really starts at that first deputy or first officer going on scene and getting as much information as possible, and then calling in the additional resources to help that person through this ordeal. Um, after that, we need to continue to do follow-up and we assign our detective to it and he he does a complete investigation and we also need to outreach in the end to the community and see how we're doing we need to reach out conduct surveys with the community see what the community what isla vista residents think of the law enforcement that's being provided here a lot of times we might think we know what the community wants but until we go and ask the community we won't really find out what's going on so we really need to do a lot more outreach in the Isla Vista community and ask specific questions on how we can improve our service. <coughs> so this will be the last topic on the, the topic of sexual assault and it's recently there's been a trend of survivors preferring to seek out resources, resources such as care on campus instead of law enforcement due to perception that justice is rarely achieved. How will you ensure that people who report sexual assault will feel like they have a reasonable chance of achieving an effective resolution for their case? And we'll start with you, Lieutenant Olmstead. I can read it again if you'd like. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, sure. Okay. Recently, there's been a trend of survivors preferring to seek out resources such as care on campus instead of law enforcement due to a perception that justice is rarely achieved. How will you ensure that people who report sexual assault will feel like they have a reasonable chance of achieving an effective resolution for their case? I, I think the primary thing is outreach to the community, asking um, what their perception is and trying to s figure out the, identify a problem that we can uh, come up with a solution. Um, I, I think educating um, the residents on sexual assault is an important part of it because there's a lot that goes into a criminal investigation. It, it's not so much the investigation that's an important part, but then when it goes through the criminal justice system, there's a lot of various things that can happen that could either enhance the case or hurt the investigation where we don't get a good resolution out of it. So part of that's educating the community on the criminal justice system and the steps before someone's affected by it, the steps that law enforcement goes through, the community goes through, plus the district attorney's office goes through to get and go through that resolution. So it's primarily education. Thank you. <coughs> so um, 
Can you read the question one more time? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All right. Recently, there has been a trend of survivors preferring to seek out resources, resources such as care on campus instead of law enforcement due to a perception that justice is rarely achieved. How will you ensure that people who report sexual assault will feel like they have a reasonable chance of achieving an effective resolution for their case? <clears throat> so, you know, the, rea the reality <laughs> is that sometimes justice is not achieved in, in these type of cases. And um, it, out in uh, college communities like this, uh, there are a lot of crimes where alcohol is involved. And, you know, there, there's a perception of, of victim blaming uh, on these types of cases. And uh, like I mentioned before, that there's, there's some things be with, within the control of a sheriff, sheriff's office, and there's some things outside of the control of a sheriff's office. So, you know, we, we need to show the community that we do the best job. We do our best for the community uh, compassionately, thoroughly, uh, investigate, collect evidence, um, and educate the community on how we collect evidence um, and, and, what, and what we need. Uh, but the reality is sometimes the evidence is not there. And once the case goes to the district attorney's office, the district attorney makes that decision not to file a case. And, and that may be because a victim really didn't know the perpetrator or or you know they they uh, they're, they're unsure or or the evidence was just not there to prosecute the case so it's you know it's one thing to make an arrest on probable cause but it's another thing to prosecute somebody beyond a reasonable doubt and uh, so we we have to make sure that that our community knows we do our damnedest the best we can to uh, prosecute these cases and to, to use compassion and to use uh, the investigative tools that we have to, at our disposal to make sure those cases uh, have, have the best uh, probability of, of being prosecuted. Uh, but sometimes there are, are cases that are, on, are beyond our control. Uh, but uh, groups like uh, CARE, they do outreach. So they do, they do a slightly different job than, than the rape crisis. So, you know, we can, we can use both of these groups out here because they're available. It's not just, a, uh, so CARE isn't just available to uh, students. They can, they can be, uh, they can serve other members of the community of Isla Vista as well. So we need to use all the resources at our disposal uh, to give the best possible service to the community and, uh, and the survivors that we can. You know, I mentioned earlier that the last thing we want is for someone who's gone through the trauma of being sexually assaulted to feel as though they're traumatized a second time while that crime is being investigated. And there are limited numbers of things that we can do to, uh, to help in that regard. Uh, there was a very interesting article that was written in the Santa Barbara Independent um, by a, a young woman who was a, a, a student here at UCSB who found herself uh, the victim of a sexual assault. And she wrote in this story that, that she struggled with what level of involvement in this act that took place that she had. Uh, there was alcohol involved with both parties. Um, there was uh, a very frank discussion about the hookup culture and the impact of uh, that on Isla Vista, the expectations that certain uh, groups of students have. Uh, and, and ultimately, she made the decision not to criminally uh, prosecute uh, or, or, or ask that her uh, assailant be criminally prosecuted. Um, and that is a choice that a victim has. And it's one that we need to respect if that's what they want. We, we need to make sure that we do a couple of things, though. We need to make sure that we investigate the case promptly, that we gather evidence that can be used if that survivor decides ultimately that they would like to seek prosecution. But ultimately, the justice system is not an easy system to navigate. Uh, a court case to uh, be won by the district attorney requires uh, that there be a burden of proof on the prosecution and that they have to be able to convince a jury 
that someone is guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. And that's a high threshold, as it should be, if you're talking about the potential to imprison someone for a crime. But nevertheless, it is a, such a high threshold that the reality is uh, many people feel as though they get victimized by having to go through the court process. They're, they have a certain amount of public uh, exposure that they have that they don't want. They get asked questions by the defense that are intrusive, uh, maybe irrelevant, maybe embarrassing. Uh, there, there are a lot of reasons that, that people have who go through this experience that they don't want to seek uh, prosecution. And, and there are cases that are, frankly, borderline type cases where there is so much alcohol that was involved that people don't really understand what happened and what they did and what they may have said in terms of that as well. And they question themselves. Um, I think it's important that we speak frankly about that subject. I think there was such a uh, concern that we were going to uh, be blaming victims, that there was almost no discussion about personal responsibility and about what can happen if you do uh, imbibe too much and if you do get to the point where you're vulnerable uh, as a potential victim of sexual assault. Uh, and then certainly we need to, to send the message to the community that there is absolutely no uh, place for uh, toleration of sexual assault in the community. So I think it's very important that we recognize that victims should be empowered to make those decisions as to whether or not they want to pursue what happened to them through the criminal justice system. And if they decide ultimately that they don't want to do that, there are still some ways for them to have some recourse. <coughs> There's potentially uh, un university involvement uh, and there is also the potential for some kind of mediation and some kind of counseling and some kind of closure that can be achieved as a result of it. But it's, it's really important to recognize that every one of these cases is different and that we have to respect uh, what it is that, uh, that the person who has been victimized wants as a result of what happened. Uh, we just have to make sure that they're fully uh, aware of what their options are and that we have done a good job in terms of obtaining and preserving <coughs> evidence so that if it does go to a court uh, situation, we, we have uh, as much evidence as we can give to the prosecution. Thank you. Okay, so now we're moving on to the second topic, which was police and resident relations. Uh, the first question that we'll pose is, in 2014, there was a riot during Deltopia and Isla Vista that led to tear gas and rubber bullets being used on residents. What steps will you take to mitigate the possibility of future riots, and how will you manage instances of public disturbances if they do occur? I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Mr. Chair. Chair. Thank you. <laughs> um, you know, again, I think that this is an area that we have already made great progress in. If you look at Deltopia uh, that occurred uh, back in 2014, um, the statistics uh, were at an all-time high that year, 130 arrests and 190 citations. Since that time, the following year, it was down to 102 arrests, 140 citations. In 2016, 45 arrests and 48 citations. 2017, 42 arrests and 68 citations, and this year, uh, 25 arrests and 56 citations. Um, so we have seen a steady downward trend, and that's not by accident. That's because we worked very diligently with students, with the university, uh, with, uh, with people who live in Isla Vista to particularly adhere to the Keep It Local campaign. I can tell you that the problems that we had uh, in 2014 at Deltopia like many of the problems that we've previously had at Halloween events and uh, periodically throughout the year, predominantly occur as a result of people who are not from Isla Vista. People who are drawn to Isla Vista by either one of these unsanctioned events that brings them in or are drawn here by an invitation to come to uh, a party. And overwhelmingly, they're the people who get arrested, they're the people who get cited to a far greater degree than the residents of Isla Vista. So we have uh, worked very col collaboratively 
with these other groups to make sure that we educate people about keeping it local. We don't want you to not have fun. We don't want you to not enjoy your college experience. But we don't want you to uh, jeopardize your safety or your community's safety uh, by inviting people or by allowing people who really have no business in Isla Vista to come here who are either seeking or involved in serious trouble. Uh, mm -hmm. I think the stats speak for themselves in that respect. I think it's very, very important that we recognize that whenever we have a problem, we need to do what we've been doing. And that is approach this through a community policing model. Community policing is when police and members of the community work together to identify and solve problems that relate to crime, fear of crime, neighborhood decay, or quality of life issues. And I think you can certainly see how many of those categories uh, the Deltopia riot, for example, impacted and the ongoing issues of out-of-town problems and troublemakers coming in. And you can see how we effectively came to some solutions by sitting down together and developing some policy. Thank you. And if you'd like to repeat the question, I can as well. Oh, that's, that's okay. I, I think I got it this time. Sounds good. So, <laughs> so um, sher the sheriff said, say, uh, unsanctioned event I want to remember that because I got something in my mind on that so uh, I was in that in those riots and I was standing on a front line and I was sucking tear gas and um, the line I was on and the person that was kind of running that line uh, did nothing that that we were trained to do from the time when I was uh, a young deputy uh, we threw gas we shot uh, uh, pepper balls until we ran out and we didn't do what we trained to do which is if you're going to do that you know you 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 give ample notice to your troops and then you shoot the pepper balls and you shoot the gas and then you take ground so you either do that or you leave and so ultimately after we exhausted everything and we had vehicles that were broken and I took three of my guys to the hospital and we took bricks and we and we uh, uh, all this all this stuff um, we left and then everybody settled down because it wasn't you know nobody was protesting a war nobody was protesting anything politically significant it was just a it was just a, a party and uh, so now getting to sanction advance um, I think the Isla Vista Community Service District is an excellent organization and I think that we can work with them uh, to do a lot more to maybe look at sanctioned events and looking at how to how to pay for these these events uh, through other type of funding I know it's measure R that is going to pass and I think that really needs to pass I think that's important for the Isla Vista service uh, uh, community service district uh, so so the community can take some some ownership uh, in responsibility of what goes on in Isla Vista and um, <clears throat> so I look at these other events uh, such as lightning in a bottle and uh, if you're familiar with with that and uh, a burning man and lucidity so lucidity I'm really close to because I worked that uh, event for years from the time uh, I was a sergeant to just this year so um, you had 5,000 people this last year at Lucidity, and it's a lucid dream uh, event, and uh, you have uh, all these people running around, and there's, there's drugs involved and, and whatnot. Not a lot of alcohol, though, and that's, and that's, that's, that's one, of the, one of the factors we have. Al alcohol is, is a lot more of a problem than some, than some drugs. But, uh, but besides that, this last Steltopia, which was was a success, it was a success. Things are really good, and, and a lot of that's because of the Isla Vista Community Service District and in the university that have other events that kind of kind of distract what's going on, and you divide you divide your your people. Some people went to to Lucidity. Some people were at Deltopia. Some people were at other events. So you kind of lower the numbers here, and so those type of things we need to do. We have we need multiple events at the same time when we have these things. But we also need to figure out a way, I think, my opinion, 
is to, to have these events sanctioned and actually fund it. So um, at Lucidity, Lucidity and some of these events, they organize very well. They organize very well. And they have, uh, like a, they have like these tents that are like crisis stabilization units. And they have all these volunteers that are trained in responding to crisis and nurses and paramedics and EMTs and people from the Army Corps that go around and they're picking people out of the crowd and bringing them over to these stations where these volunteers, they used to call them the Dream Rangers, now they're the Guardians, where they kind of let people settle down and they, and they triage them uh, where they need to go. If, they, if, they're, if they're too high, if they're intoxicated, they kind of take care of them. So uh, 5,000 people, four-day event, zero trips to the ER. Zero arrests, okay? Uh, two crisis calls during, during the weekend. Same weekend with, with, Delta, with Deltopia this year, 24, uh, 24 people taken to the ER, 25 arrests, 50 or 60 citations, somewhere around there. So I think that, that we could think outside the box a little bit, work together with the, the uh, uh, Isla Vista Community Service District and the university and other event uh, experts to uh, to to reduce some of this. So that's that's some of the ideas I've had. Thank you. I, I think uh, when you look at uh, like the statistics that were mentioned, how the arrests have gone down over the last year, which is a very positive uh, outcome, and the the majority of the responsibility for that actually comes from <laughs> the Isla Vista residents, like Eddie said. And, uh, and the university hosts an event, like I said, sort of split the group and produced and uh, had very positive events. And one of the things that there's so much positive energy out here and there's so many great ideas out in Isla Vista is we need to encourage more events. I mean, these Halloween, Deltopia, they're events, they're very specific and I think we need to diffuse the events and have more events out here, more daytime events, more festivals. Um, when I was out here before, I used to work with the cycling team, the university cycling team, and doing a bike race out here. And it was a very positive event, and it wasn't an alcohol event also. Um, unfortunately, a lot of the issues that uh, happen out here, the negative side of Isla Vista has to do with how much alcohol is drank out here. And so I think we need to encourage more events that manage the alcohol a little bit better or eliminate the alcohol in some of the daytime events. And I think by doing that and continuing working with the university, working with the university students and the residents, we'll be able to even lower those statistics, those arrest stats, that much more, try to prevent people from uh, going to the hospital, do a little bit more education on alcohol and drug use, um, to try to minimize those medical calls and those transports to the uh, hospital even on a weekend based on an every week basis because we need to minimize that throughout the year not just on Halloween or Deltopia. Thank you. Thank you. So the last question on the topic of police and resident relations is what is your stance on medical amnesty for people reporting instances of drug or alcohol abuse to law enforcement? How would you handle cases in which an emergency is reported around an activity such as underage drinking or illicit drug use? And we'll start with you, Lieutenant Olsen. Um, we have to have programs that don't um, encourage people not to call law enforcement for medical emergencies. Unfortunately, like I said, we have a lot of alcohol use. We have a lot of drug use out here. We've had several instances of drug overdoses where the, the deputies have administered the Narcan to reverse the effects of the opiate overdoses. Um, we need to do a lot more education and we also need to encourage people when they see this happening to make sure they call law enforcement because it's, it's, it's too important. We need to get that medical response there, get the person treated so they don't die. And unfortunately through the years we've had a lot of students, whether they're freshmen or even a week away from graduation or so, dying because of drug overdoses and alcohol overdoses and falling from the cliff because of the alcohol and drug use. Um, we need to do that education. We need to encourage people to call. Um, it's a lot more important to get the medical help than to make an arrest. We need to look at sobering centers. 
um, and that's gone up and down through the years. But there's ways that we can do it and funding that we can develop that helps with sobering centers so we don't have to take as many people to the jail. They don't have to get that arrest record. Um, but we can still have accountability so people don't abuse a sobering system, sobering center system, things like that. Um, uh, but we really need to do the education. And when we do see these overdoses, we need to go after the people that are furnishing the, the opiates and causing the, uh, the overdoses because those people are the ones that are taking advantage of people and encouraging them to use or making the product that much available out here where we've uh, seen multiple overdoses. I mean, we had one instance where 10 people went to the hospital for opiate overdose treatment, and that's unacceptable in any community that we have to worry about that kind of emergency response. It's not only dangerous for the students, but it's also takes resources. I mean, to transport nine, ten people takes a lot of ambulances, a lot of first responders doing that, and so we need more education to try to reduce those effects. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I agree a lot with Lieutenant Olmstead on many of those those uh, topics, and I, I would definitely be behind any written procedures or policies making medical issues first and because this, it's, a, it's mainly about public trust so we have to build trust with the public that you know we're, we're going to do the right thing for them which is protecting life right so that's our main thing is protecting life so uh, the public needs to feel safe that they're not going to go to jail if if they're calling us on an emergency like that and so uh, I would be completely behind written procedures, uh, policies on that, and educating the public that they're going to be safe and they need to call us because we want people to call. We want people to report crimes, we want people to, to report, you know, if, if, a, if a roommate is, is overdosing on opiates, we, we, want, we want to call. Uh, we want to be able to save a life. And so all of the deputies have um, access to Narcan. Uh, not every agency does. Uh, actually, uh, uh, in Lompoc, I was actually canvassing the other uh, the other day, a couple days ago, and I came across a, a person in an alley who was on his knees and his head was down, he wasn't breathing, and uh, so I, I set him up and he had OD on, on opiates. So, um, and uh, Lompoc PD didn't have Narcan, so so that was uh, that was kind of surprising to me. Um, we need to have those tools to to protect life. You know, Narcan, uh, uh, AEDs. You know, those those type of things. So um, it's about public trust, and we need to we need to have the public trust. Without public trust, we can't do our job and protect the public. Well, I think this is one question that we're all going to agree on. Uh, mm -hmm. The reality is that uh, the sanctity of life is extremely important that we don't want anything that would prevent someone from calling us if there was a chance of, of assisting someone and saving someone's life. Um, the Narcan program that was mentioned is a program that under my leadership was brought to the Sheriff's Office. We're the first law enforcement agency in this county, in the Tri-County area, that actually developed a Narcan program. And to date we have had, um, uh, up until about a month ago, we had ten confirmed saves that have occurred as a result of deputies administering Narcan in the field. And uh, a number of cases here in Isla Vista. And the reality is that, um, you know, this is an epidemic problem in our country. Last year we had over 66,000 people that died of uh, opioid overdoses in the United States. That is more people in one year dying of drug overdoses than died during the entire Vietnam War. Americans that were killed in the Vietnam War. So that is a, a, a reprehensible statistic that we all need to, to work on and to do something about. Uh, and I certainly would be, um, you know, I don't believe that we have a practice of uh, taking anyone to jail. If, there's, if they're not culpable in terms of someone's overdose, um, I don't think that we, we, we wouldn't take them to jail. I don't think our district attorney would file charges against anyone. I believe that uh, people have to be able to call us in, in an event like that. Uh, to make sure that um, 
that, that proper medical care is is, is sent. And uh, I would I would be very supportive if if it was if there was a need to develop a certain policy or procedure to do that. But I think that our uh, men and women who are out in the field, and I think that our men and women who are in the district attorney's office uh, would not be prone to prosecuting someone uh, for calling and getting medical assistance, again, if they were not culpable in terms of it, having administered the drug or something like that. Thank you. So now, before we move on to public forum, we're going to move on to Facebook questions, and we have two of those. Um, so these are just ones that students and community members have, have posted and we picked the two that we thought were important. Uh, the first one is, what does a perfect budget for the sheriff's office, office look like, and what are the pressing needs at the moment? Um, and start with you again. Well, thank you. Well, the perfect budget. Uh, I don't know how you nef necessarily would define that, and probably there would be some disagreement between what I would believe would be the perfect budget and the Board of Supervisors, who ultimately sets our budget, would believe. But the reality is the Sheriff's Office budget uh, is and has been inadequate for many, many years. Um, in 2007, ironically the year that I became the Sheriff, we were at our high point in terms of staffing in the Sheriff's Office. Since that time, the, net, the year following that, in 2008, we had the start of the Great Recession. And in the wake of the Great Recession and the years intervening uh, after, after that, uh, we have seen a steady uh, situation where our budgets have either been in decline or status quo. And during that time, during those 11 budget years, we in the Sheriff's Office have lost 90.5 general fund positions. That means that we have 90.5 fewer people in the Sheriff's Office that are paid for through the general fund than we had back in 2007. Um, that's not to say that our budget hasn't increased, because it has. It's increased because the cost of doing business has increased substantially, uh, particularly in the area of salaries, benefits, including pensions, um, insurance costs and just general increases in terms of services and products and goods that we need in the Sheriff's Office to work. So although our budget has increased, our actual numbers of people have decreased and have diminished. The work hasn't gone away. It's certainly, um, there's as much or more work than there's ever been. Our population has increased uh, somewhat since that time, since, the, since 2007. And uh, so what is the perfect budget? I don't think that we can pull a number out, of, and I think any of us would be hard pressed to give you that tonight. But I think I can tell you that we need to have sufficient numbers of custody deputies working in our jail. Uh, we've had two staffing studies that have occurred that have recommended additional positions. Um, unfortunately, they've come during these years of budget decline when the board's options in terms of funding those positions has been limited and the board has not chosen to give us the additional funds to hire people into those positions. Uh, likewise, we have seen some reductions, although not many, but we have seen some reductions in the deputy sheriff ranks uh, in patrol operations. Uh, we have had to make a uh, substantial amount of cuts in our support services and in our um, non-frontline or non-emergency type uh, staffing positions like detectives, for example, uh, some of the specialized units. We've lost a number of different um, crime prevention programs and, and personnel as a result of this. And we're not alone, certainly. There's, this is something that many, many other law enforcement agencies have had to struggle with as a result of uh, increasing costs and declining revenues that have occurred. Uh, but my hope would be that we would look for ways to uh, continue to try to build back some of those positions uh, on an incremental basis over the years uh, to really work with the Board of Supervisors to recognize that we can't fill them all immediately. It's going to take, uh, take time to do that. Um, but it's important that we work and recognize uh, that we are working with far fewer people than we have in the past. But despite that challenge, despite the problems that that causes, the service levels that are delivered by the Sheriff's Office, by the men and women of the Sheriff's Office, are still exceptional. It's exceptional service, and the levels are still extraordinary, uh, given the resources that we have. 
Uh, not much to add. It's hard to say what the perfect budget is. I was going to say one billion dollars. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I I could just echo what the sheriff has said on on what that would be. I I have to repeat what both of them said is that there it's very hard to build a perfect budget, but there's a couple things that we can address to to help us. Um, one is we've lost, like the sheriff said, 90 positions, but we also have right now about 50 funded vacancies that we need to fill, and the majority of them are in the sworn position, the law enforcement deputy, the patrol deputy, or the detective, almost 30, and then um, about 10 or 15 on the, uh, the custody deputy side. So with these vacancies, since we're having, we're, we haven't developed a recruitment plan, to recruit deputies and custody deputies that it's costing us, oh, we're going over budget every single year, four and a half million dollars in our overtime budget. So that negatively affects our overall budget. And the Board of Supervisors has to continue adding money to make the department basically pay their bills. And we need to address the recruiting problem. I mean, recently the grand jury came out with a report saying this is devastating on the sheriff's office and that the sheriff's office hasn't addressed that properly they haven't invested enough um, financially in recruiting people but also they haven't evaluated how it's taken a toll on the employees themselves in the jail the custody deputies have worked mandatory overtime for over a decade now and it's adding to fatigue fatigue adds to mistakes which can cost us money in the long run plus it negatively affects the family life too with the mandatory overtime also on the, the budget side is we need to improve the relationship with the Board of Supervisors. Right now, unfortunately, because of the leadership, we have a poor relationship with the Board of Supervisors, and that's documented by them, different Board of Supervisors specifically saying that. And the solution to that is looking to change the leadership. We, I've been endorsed by the majority of the Board of Supervisors, or more Board of Supervisors than the current sheriff. Supervisor Hartman endorsed me. Supervisor Peter Adam uh, endorsed me. Incoming Supervisor, Santa Barbara City Councilman Greg Hartz endorsed me. And so by the time I would take office in January, three of the five Board of Supervisors have endorsed me and want to work with me to try to improve the budget situation and make things work out better for the community and for the department. Great, thank, thank you. you. So the last question coming from Facebook is, Will you stop the practice of releasing information about jail inmates and county residents to ICE? And we'll start with you, Lieutenant Shoy. Yes, I mean, I, my stance on that is, is yes, uh, except with, with violent, uh, violent, serious criminals. Uh, I think that, uh, again, with public trust, we need to instill in the community that, that the, the public can trust us to report crimes, they can they can trust us to uh, not stand to be a victim because because of fear of, of ICE, uh, of us of cooperating with ICE and, and turning them in and, and having them deported, separating families. Um, uh, we we need to to have the trust of the community and to be able to protect them, and uh, and that that's the main uh, that's the main problem with with. Uh, assisting ICE and using resources and funding to, uh, to uh, do the job of, of ICE agents uh, uh, enforcing a civil immigration law. Uh, unfortunately, the system's broken. I mean, we need comprehensive immigration reform, and we need to follow the law, the state law. and. Uh, Right now, we have a process just through our jail record system that anyone can find out the release date of inmates. And that's primarily for uh, victims of crimes to know if the suspect in that crime will be released. And a lot of other agencies, that's how um, federal agencies and victims of crime are identifying people when they're being released. And that program continues primarily for the victims of crimes to know when their suspect's gonna get released. Um, the Sheriff's Office, 
we're not immigration officers. We need to concentrate on protecting the community and removing violent people from the community to, to protect the community. And that's our primary responsibility is protecting life. Thank you. The, the subject of um, immigration and particularly of notifications to ICE uh, about people that are in jail is one that is a very sensitive and controversial one in many ways. Um, my position on it, my personal position, and the position that I took and that I was the spokesperson for, for the State Sheriff's Association, of which I was the president up until very recently, um, is what I believe is a very common sense approach. We made it very, very clear that we in law enforcement and local law enforcement are not immigration police. We're not the federal authorities. And we want the people who are in our communities to not be afraid to report to us if they've been the victim of a crime or if they've witnessed a crime. However, when someone is arrested for a serious or violent offense, that person, in my estimation, should not be released from custody if our federal law enforcement counterparts have notified us that that person is wanted on federal charges and we have an opportunity to advise. We're not, we're not physically handing them over. We're just advising them when that person is going to be released from jail. And I think that we have an obligation to the community to do that in cases where people have been arrested for serious or violent offenses. And unfortunately, SB 54, when it was passed, was passed in such a way that many crimes, many serious and violent crimes, were excluded from the list of exceptions which allow uh, for notification of uh, ICE agents uh, at their request when someone is being released from jail. Uh, the crimes, for example, that are not covered are crimes like assault on a peace officer, domestic violence, animal cruelty, um, crimes that involve uh, serial theft, for example. Someone could be arrested 30 times for having stolen um, items from some uh, business, for example. And uh, that person under the current law would not be, that would not be a reportable offense. Um, the other uh, two areas that are, are problematic, that are not listed in the list of exceptions, involve people who are known members of criminal street gangs, um, MS-13, for example, is an extremely violent international gang with a presence here in the United States and has had a presence directly in Santa Maria, where they were directly responsible for, believed to be responsible, for 15 murders. And when law enforcement comes into contact with and arrests someone who is a, a gang member, like an MS-13 gang member, let's say for possessing a weapon or for uh, some other uh, misdemeanor offense. Um, I think that it's pretty common sense that we should not be releasing that person uh, if we have a request from our federal counterparts to notify them uh, when they are released. And then the last area is in when someone makes bail. The notifications that you mentioned and talked about in terms of um, the uh, notifications uh, being either posted on the website or exceptions in SB 54 do not include when someone is bailed out of jail. And we recently had a case to the north of us, I'm sorry, to the south of us in Ventura County where a person was arrested for a child molestation that occurred repeatedly over a number of years. And that person, uh, his fingerprints were put through the system, the federal system, the ICE authorities told the sheriff's office that they wanted to be notified because he was wanted for federal charges. It didn't meet the criteria of SB 54. There was no notification. That person was released on bail. When, when the ICE authorities ultimately went to try to get this person and look for him, he had absconded and he was a fugitive. And it's believed he's probably fled the country. And what happens now is that 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 young woman who was victimized by this person won't get justice as a result of that policy. The state will not hold someone accountable who has committed uh, a series of crimes over many years against a vulnerable victim. And wherever that person went, whatever other country, if they did flee the country, there's a very strong likelihood that that person's going to reoffend again. And it just doesn't make sense that in those instances, in a case where someone is wanted 
by the federal authorities that we should not be able to notify them of the time that they're being released from jail. The State Sheriff's Association has recognized this. We have worked with uh, several legislators and have some legislation which is currently um, working its way, uh, well, well, we hope it will work its way through the legislature. We have to get it through committee first. But it's a cleanup bill that would address these types of problems. And again, we're not talking about going out and arresting people for very minor crimes and turning them over to ICE authorities. We're talking about people who commit very serious crimes, whether they're felonies or high-grade misdemeanors, uh, who are a potential, uh, who have a likelihood of reoffending if they're released back into the community, and we have an option and ability to get that person um, removed from the community. Thank you. So now we're going to open the floor uh, to public questions. Uh, we ask that you, you can direct your question to the entire um, forum, or you can direct your question to one specific candidate. Um, we are supposed to be out of here around 8.30, so we'll ask for about maybe four or five questions. Um, does anyone have any questions for the candidates right now? Yes, please. Hey, everyone. Uh, you all mentioned in some degree uh, community outreach and education. I want to see if you could all give us a little blurb on what community feedback means for you and how you would be seeking that as sheriff. And we'll still try to keep answers around two minutes. Oh. Well, I, I, I think one of the one of the things we need to do to engage with the community is we need to put out surveys because the sheriff's office covers multiple communities. The Isla Vista community is different from the Orca community or the San Inez community. And I really think we need to outreach and see what the community expects in their law enforcement service. I, I think Isla Vista is a unique uh, area because there's, there's groups, there's clubs, there's the community service district, there's the university, um, there's all these different groups that are already organized and that can bring um, ideas already to the sheriff's office so we need to work with these different groups and also reach out and find out what our surveys will do and then a part of it is since most of the patrolling done in Isla Vista is done on foot I mean I spent six years out here working patrol and meeting with groups and working with the Isla Vista Youth Center at barbecues and and working with the people that serve the the children out in Isla Vista and it's really just getting out and communicating, talking, and being just consensual contacts, just walking around, not during a law enforcement contact or anything, just going and talking to the community and seeing what the community needs. I, you know, I, I hear people tell me that they like to see more regular, like town hall meetings, regular meetings, like face-to-face -face meetings and for uh, leaders to be more available. So uh, uh, programs like uh, UCPD where the, the lieutenant locally has, has an open schedule for people to come in and meet with him and talk about issues in the community. I think, I think that can be done at each station. I think that can be done in each area of the, of the county uh, to have that more face-to-face -face with, with the leaders. And also like a collaborative panel of, of uh, a diverse group of community members from, from each area that the sheriff would meet with on a regular basis and, uh, and get together and talk about community issues. And also when something happens in the community for us to get out in front of it and be transparent and, and talk about those issues and solicit opinions from the community and what, on what programs are important to them and, and how and how we're doing as, as a law enforcement agency. So you know, uh, I, I think uh, I think the face-to-face -face interaction is is the most important thing. You know, the sheriff is the only elected law enforcement officer position uh, that there is, and it's very very important for all of us to be able to, all of those of us who are privileged to be sheriffs, to listen and engage with our community. And we do that in a variety of different ways. Um, I respond to numerous phone calls, emails, and letters on a personal basis every week. Um, here in Isla Vista, I think we do an extraordinary job of developing ways to interact with the community. 
Uh, just a few examples of that are uh, coffee with a cop, which uh, became coffee and donut with a cop, which I think is a little stereotypical maybe there. But uh, cupcakes with a cop, pancake breakfasts, pizza with a cop. There's a lot of food involved here. Regular meetings with the community <coughs> services district, meetings with the associated student body, monthly community network meetings, collaborative efforts with students with respect to Halloween and Deltopia, the Isla Vista SAFE Committee, which has been meeting regularly and which has representatives from the university, from the uh, community services district, from um, both uh, uh, city college as well as other groups that involve uh, our constituents. I think these are all very, very important things to have. And as your sheriff, I have been and I will continue to be available and open to meeting with people. I meet regularly with people who don't agree with me. Um, you know, groups that, uh, that, that do have issues or do have problems. And I think it's important for me to sit down and listen and hear what they have to say. And I think it's important for them to listen to what we in the sheriff's office have to say as well. That dialogue, that ability to sit down and reason with each other is an important component of policing and particularly what we practice regularly in the sheriff's office which is community policing where again community members and the sheriff's office work together to identify and solve problems related to crime the fear of crime neighborhood decay and quality of life issues thank you are there any other questions yes, okay, uh, mine's to do with um, campaign disclosure because i was looking at your websites and the, um, the amount of money that's writing on the different campaigns here and so I noticed that Shway agreed to a voluntary campaign expenditure limit of 153000 Well, Brown and Olmstead did not. And in fact, I think, um, Brown, you've got like over 145000 riding on your campaign so far. And Olmstead, I think you've got 66000 so far. So I'm wondering, um, given that amount of money that's riding on your two campaigns, um, what does it say about your priorities with regard to serving the community? So, uh, that, uh, yeah, by far, running for office and the raising of, of campaign money is the worst thing of politics, by far. I don't like asking people for money. The reason why I, I didn't agree to the 153000 limit is because, frankly, because the sheriff didn't. And I knew that he could raise a lot of money through his 12 years of contacts being here. And in order to try to compete, you'd have to raise money. Um, I've asked uh, um, different donors for money. I've never promised anything. I would never do that. But un unfortunately, um, the negative side of politics is you have to raise money to um, do commercials or purchase signs and other things. And uh, um, that's the most unfortunate thing about uh, politics. Ideally, it would be that they automatically say this is the limit and, uh, and that's what each candidate spends. Would you like to say something, Ed? Um, well, I, I uh, have been doing things a bit differently. I mean, all, all of my, my uh, folks that uh, are supporting me are all volunteers, and I'm uh, very fortunate that they are really working really hard for me and, and pushing me and, and believe in me. And uh, I've kind of, this is kind of how I've rolled in my career. I've, I've had to work a little bit harder and, and uh, uh, try to uh, do things a little bit, a little bit differently. So uh, I've, I've been out there every day, uh, sometimes uh, 16 hours a day, wa uh, going to uh, events and, and anybody who, who wants to hear me talk at nauseum and uh, uh, knocking on doors and uh, it's been very grassroots, and uh, it's been a, a journey, a, a learning uh, experience in uh, communicating with, with the public and what's important to them and whatnot. And uh, talk, talk about Senate Bill 54, um, I, I actually had many people I talked to that, that had been affected by this, and some of the issues I wasn't aware of before, and I had, I had a, a uh, a man and his wife who took in a young boy uh, when that boy was eight or so and raised that young boy and uh, put him through uh, a college, community college, I think it was Santa Barbara City College, 
and he got a DUI, and uh, it was his one and only arrest. And uh, they told me in tears that uh, he was in a supervised release program and uh, ended up getting called called on by local law enforcement and uh, uh, got taken by ICE. So, you know, the, these these issues I I I didn't know were were occurring, and so it's been a, a, a journey for me. Um, I have a different take on on Senate Bill 54. When when I read it, uh, every assault, you know, you could cooperate with with uh, ICE. Uh, every uh, 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 serial theft crime, as as was said, you could cooperate. I saw very little little uh, uh, crimes that were not listed that you that you could not cooperate with ICE, other than the. Uh, the the simple one-time misdemeanor offenses. So of course, if it's if it's a if it's a specific uh, uh, community safety need, we, we need to we need to cooperate, and we, and we should not let gang members. Uh, gang crimes were also listed in there. So so I'm not really sure what uh, if I'm reading something wrong or 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 uh, uh, misinterpreting something, but that's that's how I saw it. And um, so, uh, and the other thing is, is we just recently, within this year, I believe, took the office from from ICE out of the jail because we did we did have an office available for them. So um, we we need to keep the community safe in those those situations, but we also need to have equality and and build public trust in our communities as well. Uh, getting back to your question about the campaign disclosure, the limits, and why I didn't uh, agree to them, the reality is running a countywide office, uh, running for a countywide office, requires getting your message out to all the voters in the county. We have 204,000 registered voters in Santa Barbara County, and if you wanted to try to get one piece of literature or a radio commercial or a viewing of a TV commercial or something, even if you spent a dollar per capita, you'd need over $200,000 to run um, a, a campaign that would, uh, that would do that effectively. And uh, that is the reality of running in a countywide uh, race. It's not a city council race. It's not a uh, a, a, even a, a supervisor's race in a, in a supervisorial district in the county. It's the entire county. So the message has to be um, sent and hopefully received by voters from throughout the county in all the different uh, communities. And um, that is just really part and parcel of, of it. And really, I mean, the reality is our political system is set up in such a way that uh, it does require money to, to run a campaign. Uh, and to be effective, you have to go out and raise that money. Uh, and I'm actually very proud of the fact that I have had well over 200 people donate to my campaign and that they believe in me and are confident enough in what I'm doing that they want to see me reelected and that they have <laughs> contributed to my campaign. So I think that that is something that is a reality that we all have to deal with. Um, and until and unless there's, you know, some artificial limit that is maybe put on that. Um, I think that to run an effective campaign, you have to go out and raise sufficient money to get your message out to the people. Thank you. Are there any other questions? <coughs> yeah, go ahead. <clears throat> yeah, I think that it's really disappointing um, because all of the candidates seem to agree with each other. Um, and maybe it says something to us as a community that if we want to change policing relations, um, and how this county operates, it doesn't matter who is gonna be elected sheriff. Um, they all speak the same language about the budget, about community policing. Community policing is not lining up sheriffs in SWAT gear and shooting them with tear gas um, and with, with rubber bullets. Community <coughs> policing is not setting up checkpoints throughout town and trying to measure success via the number of people arrested and given tickets. I'd also like to say to the positions that weren't shared here, that weren't even asked about, because the people that were deported didn't give a, did, don't have a chance to defend themselves. The people that have died while sheriff, under Sheriff Brown's supervision haven't had a chance to defend themselves. The people who are currently being put in his prisons, in his jails, 
aren't here and they're not having their perspectives listened to. So I don't have a question, I have a comment. Uh, but I turned over to someone else. Anybody else have a question? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, um, hi. Um, could each of you, mine's really quick, but uh, could each of you right now on the record uh, denounce white supremacy um, without mincing words? Please. Start with you. I'm happy to denounce white supremacy. Do it unequivocally. Yeah, me too. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Everyone's Woo! equal. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah, I guess you need the last question. question. Um, so I actually I have a testimonial. I made a Google form so that people could um, give testimonials that didn't feel safe saying it, so I'm gonna say this for someone else. Um, one of the police officers arrested me without reading my Miranda rights or giving me a reason why I was arrested in Ayalista. My friend stepped on my shoe and I leaned on a car to put my foot back and retie my shoe. The second I started walking again, she immediately came up and said, come over here for a second and told me to face the vehicle and started putting handcuffs on me without a word of explanation or legalities. I was super compliant, respectful, and eerily calm since I was so scared if I did anything, it, I would get worse action against me that I shut down my emotions. When I asked her why I was getting arrested, she only asked me, asked back why I was behind the car. When I told her I was just to tie my shoe, shoes, which my five plus friends watched me do, she didn't give a response like she didn't believe me, and she just kept continuing doing the protocol procedure. She never did any physical tests to see if I was intoxicated or used a breathalyzer, but arrested me disorderly contact. Even, um, even I did not lash back at all, was compliant, and no proof of intoxication. How are you as a sheriff going to make sure all the officers respect and follow a protocol for any arrest or legal action to, or procedure against a community? How are you going to hold the officers accountable if they do break protocol or policies? Are you here to protect potential corruption of power within your team and anyone you represent, or are you committed to holding your officers accountable for corruptive or negligent actions, even if it puts you in a line of negative PR and extra labor? Obviously, it, it's hard to comment on a specific incident because we haven't seen the reports or talked to the person the, in person, but um, I, I expect all deputies to follow, follow proper procedures, and if they don't, there's a process that through a complaint process that we can investigate and then their discipline through that process. I mean, if if any deputy or any employee of the sheriff's office goes against department policy, then there's consequences. I mean, um, we need to make sure that we have the trust of the public and, uh, and that's through doing things right. Um, so uh, obviously if she fills that, or um, uh, fills that they did something incorrect then they need to report that to a supervisor um, and I know it's difficult um, for people to put a complaint process the sheriff's office has a complaint process but I think part of outreaching to the community it will lower the feelings of making it difficult to report uh, um, violations of policy and violations of law by law enforcement so I think we need to do more outreach and like I said, I think it's going out there, walking up and down the streets, making contacts, just consensual encounters where they're just seeing how their day's going, the, the deputy or the officers talking about how their day's going and uh, it's just a, a, a nice contact. And as we do more outreach, I think the trust will improve. Thank you. So law, law enforcement is, is given it, it, an ultimate power, right? We can we can uh, use force. We can take a life. We can take somebody's freedom away. So we need to be held accountable. We need to have officers. We need to hold hold ourselves at, at, a, at a high level of accountability. And uh, uh, like Lieutenant Olmstead said, it's very hard for specific uh, uh, incidents like that where you where you hear uh, a little bit of the information. And uh, you know that's that's uh, that's one of these uh, cases where, to to me, quite frankly, it, it sounds like uh, something that we could sit down and talk to that person uh, one on one, and and more than likely resolve it through uh, training that per or explaining to that person 
what the procedures are or what the officers saw and, uh, and, and bringing them together to, to talk about it. Um, but but we, we need to hold our officers accountable. And if, if, they're, if an officer is doing something wrong or abusing public trust, then that needs to be dealt with uh, swiftly and, and, and uh, uh, completely. And I guess the, I would echo what, what my two opponents have said in many respects. Um, it is very difficult when we have something that we get one side of a story on. There are always multiple sides to a story, and um, there may be a different perspective, there may be a very different situation, but nevertheless, if someone feels as though that they have not been treated fairly or properly, I think that they should, uh, and I encourage them to bring that to our attention. And if it happened here in Isla Vista, I would recommend that that person report it to the Isla Vista Foot Patrol, ask to speak to um, the commander of the Foot Patrol, um, and uh, Lieutenant Camarena, and I think that, uh, as, as Eddie said, it might be something that could be resolved at that level if it's something that is truly believed to be egregious on the part of, uh, assuming that it was a sheriff's deputy, uh, if it was a, a, a police officer would go the other route through their chain of command, but the reality is that we need to investigate uh, allegations of misconduct, and we do. We have a process to do that. Um, we recognize that we're not always, we don't always do things the right way. We recruit people from the human race. People make mistakes. Um, and if they do make a mistake and that mistake involves uh, mistreating someone or not acting uh, in a proper manner, then we do need to hold that person accountable. And I have a lengthy track record of doing just that. And I've terminated employees for not treating people the right way. And, uh, and we'll continue to do that as your sheriff. I think it's very, very important that uh, we don't send a message that um, any kind of mistreatment of our constituents, whether they happen to be people that we're arresting or not, uh, is not to be tolerated. And uh, I can assure you that uh, that, that would continue in, in my uh, future term of office. All right, well, thank you candidates for coming out tonight and thank you audience. This was a great showing and really appreciate you all here and make sure to vote on June 5th. And have a good rest of your night, okay?